Shout out to insecure boyfriends. Shout out. Shout out, yeah. shout out, shout out <laughs> big insecure Shout out ex boyfriends. Yeah. Who's laughing now? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs>
um, some math class, like some kind of math class, which I math is not my thing. And we ended up we Me too. unexpectedly my freshman year, we ended up going really far into we ended up winning the tournament, but we were seated pretty low. And so none of our games were home for the last like four weeks of the season. So I just missed basically half the semester like we were just yeah. gone the whole time so i got c's in like two classes and that was the end of that so, so i was that like season two must be nice let's go what uh so when you started your college career did you have any aspirations like you're coming in freshman year you're gonna have a good four years and play pro or is it kind of more of like i'm gonna use this for college and have fun and see what happens um i don't think i ever thought i was good enough to play pro I just never saw that being in the cards for me. I really wanted to be really good at Northeastern and I wanted to have a really good career, but I wasn't doing it with the thought that the next step was going to be to go pro. So I just thought, and no, it wasn't like, oh, I'm I'm really going to focus on my education yeah. either. <laughs> like yeah. I was there to play exactly. and um, I did good in school, but I wasn't completely. Yeah, C's get degrees. Yeah, no, that was that was the only semester I ended up graduating with a really good GPA. Like once I transferred into communications, which, yeah, nice. Um, you know, it was Northeastern's a good school, so it was still challenging, but it is a bit of a nothing degree. So when I graduated, I was looking at like marketing or PR or jobs in those kinds of fields, and I realized I was only applying at like Reebok and Puma yeah. and like cool spots. any of the, any of the sports related companies. And then I just thought to myself, and those also were the most competitive, everybody wanted those jobs. Um, so I wasn't getting them and I just decided I was going to go and get my personal training cert and I did. And then I applied at Equinox and started training there. And I trained there for like seven years, six or seven years. So what do you think like the, lifting weights is something you're into kind of bug like bit you um was it like during your college careers or right after when you need some structure and didn't know it what was you during doing or? yeah it was definitely during for sure um we got a female strength coach um my junior or senior year i can't remember and that was like a little bit of a turning point for me because i think up until that point we really felt like they took the football program and just slapped it in front of us and we were just like yeah you're gonna do all the same it just felt like this isn't helping us you yeah. don't you're not thinking about actually what's gonna help us do better at our sport you're just giving us this like plug and chug program right here yeah you, you're gonna do weights now yeah football yeah. did this at nine and you're lifting at 10 so for real the yeah bars and stuff are already out so let's um, get after it <laughs> and so then getting a, a like a female strength coach that had played sports in college yeah. and that we could relate to a little bit more and just was like, you guys don't need to do more cardio. All you do is cardio. Cause that's what we would do. Like we, if we had spare time, we would go to the gym and we would run on the treadmill mm -hmm. or we would like do more and more cardio. And finally she broke that habit and she wasn't making us do crazy stuff. It was just like, this is how this applies to your sport. This is, how this is going to make you better mm -hmm. and you you've got the cardio piece down so if you can add this piece it's only going to improve your performance so that is when it sort of clicked for me and when i started doing it more i started getting better at it like i definitely noticed that compared to my other friends in the weight room that it was like easier for me to lift heavier and i could just do more which I love because I'm competitive and I just wanted to be better Recurring than everybody. Recurring theme. I like it. Recurring theme. <laughs> and <clears throat> yeah, so I think like once I graduated college, like I was still going to the gym, but I was still doing, I was running all the time. Um, and honestly, when I was bartending, I would bartend until like two, I would get home at 2.30 or three and then I would sleep until, I don't know, noon or like 11.30. So I would get up. And I would have time to go for a run and get back, shower, maybe do like one thing. And then I was back at work. So it was still a lot of running post-college. Um, but I remember my friend in college had worked at Equinox and like really liked it and had a good time. And it just like seemed like a fun environment. And I liked the gym. So I just was like, fuck it. 
Let's yeah. do it. Like there's no, there's no like inspiring piece of like, oh, my dream was always to be a personal trainer. I was just like, I'm just going to try this and see what happens. And I don't know what ended so up. So throughout your, your time at Equinox, cause you, you've gotten a lot of continued education. You have, you see your, you got your CSCS. I do not have my CSCS. You don't? No. I thought you did. I'm thinking of RKC. That's what it is. Yeah. What, what, what was your continued education journey like with Equinox? Cause I know they have their whole. Equinox, well. if they do one thing well, it's that they provide education for you. Not everything is necessarily what I would consider valuable now, looking back at like like my Viper certification, I don't think is really applying anywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember don't how popular those things were? Those things were like all the rage for basketball. Like you couldn't find a basketball weight room oh. without Viper. So Vipers are basically a big weighted tube i guess with yeah, handles and you can do handles. functional right things and you can do like the, the lateral yeah movement yeah where you cross yeah. over you shift it and you do like a chop right yeah i feel like it's just one of those things like great for a warm-up yes. whatever but like too many people make that like their program and it's like if you know anything about training like you can't really progressively overload yeah. no Viper. so you kind of get to a point where it's a great warm-up tool but yeah, once again, like they're you're not going like, to use that to just so, so expensive. expensive. Yeah, yes. they're crazy. So for expensive. the average person, it makes no sense. Like they had them at Equinox. But the best part about that is whenever there was like some kind of workshop or seminar or whatever, everybody that went to the seminar the next week, oh, all yeah. of their programming is oh, yeah. all Viper. Everything, <laughs> yeah. everything all your clients are doing is Viper. Um, <laughs> but anyways, they they did do a good job of bringing in education in order to move through the tier system, which dictates how much you get paid for your sessions, you have to do continued education. So the more you move up, you do like the tier three training, and that's more extensive than the tier one and the tier two training. And they had coaches that did the education. Like I still have a friend that works at Equinox and he does like, he's like in charge of all the education in Boston and he's great, super smart. Mm. Um, and so you could kind of pick and choose the things that you wanted to take, but you had access to all that stuff for free. Which, if you're wow. getting started out as a coach, like that's that's pretty valuable. Huge. Um, and you know they rob you in other ways, but <laughs> sure, you you definitely get to become a more educated and better coach through training in an environment like that. I think. Well, you and I are similar in that regard because I started training gen pop more corporate settings, and obviously, you know there are drawbacks to that. Neither of us are doing that anymore. <laughs> you know, there's there are reasons why, but there are also a lot of benefits. And like, you know, at least for me, like getting reps, working with Gen Pop. Um, for you, what are some of the benefits? And how long were you there? I think like seven years, if I'm remembering that correctly. So okay. what what is you know from your time there? What do you feel like are the things that you took away from that experience that still are helpful for you today? So many things. I think. Now, like I get a lot of exposure to influencers and influencer coaches. Yeah. And one of the things that I say all the time is what they're lacking. And this is not a knock on them. It's just the way that it is, is mm -hmm. that most of those coaches have not ever coached people in person. Which I think is crazy that you pay someone that's never worked with somebody and then they're know. prescribing programs. Yeah. For people. Well, I like, think the crux of the problem is like people don't people who don't know training like we do don't understand the inherent value of spending years working with people in person. They see their favorite influencer, the person that they're like, God, I, I would love to look like that. Or I like the way that they approach working out. It aligns with me somehow. And the thought never even crosses the mind that perhaps they've never actually done this. Yeah, this is new to me. I thought every coach like worked with people and that's how you got your reps. No. And now I'm just learning like, Oh yeah, they're just worked out on their own and then tell you what has worked for them. Yeah, and listen, a, lo a lot of them are, are certified. They're technically qualified to do what they do. Mm -hmm. But to circle back to your question, what I got out of that is exactly what you said. Reps with every different type of person, yeah. every body shape, every age every preference, every goal, every, like you, you see it all in that type of environment and yeah, you're programming for those people. You are problem solving for those people in the moment. You're learning that 
the things that you think will work on paper don't always work in person. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been incredibly valuable for me with my online career and training on an app where you actually, when you're programming and when I'm, I have to do voiceovers for all of my workouts, it's like, it makes it so much easier for me to give people cues that are actually meaningful or give them information that's ac actually meaningful when they get into the gym and they have to be problem solving on their own. When you've yeah. tried it with seven years plus of clients with different skill levels, yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the value of getting the Viper certification. True. Next day showing up to work, it's like, we're doing Viper now. Yeah. That's what we do. <laughs> and then realizing it's like, oh, this ain't it yeah. for most of the people that I'm working with. And then it fizzles out. Yeah. But you repeat that process enough and you really sharpen your sword. Yeah. And you you definitely get to the point where you realize that being dogmatic about one training system or one piece of equipment or one whatever is going to put you in a place where you're no longer a good trainer. Yeah. And you're Can't no evolve. longer actually giving people what they want or need because your own obsession with that thing is clouding what you can provide to people. Yep. And I see that a lot where it's not necessarily, oh, it's we do see a lot of dogma around certain training systems, <laughs> but it's also like, I know what I know and this is how I do it. Yeah. And take it or leave it, you know, where yep. it's less of of understanding that you don't know everything and that mm. you, you know, a lot of these influencers are 20, 23, 24 years old, maybe. Mm -hmm. And when I think about what I was doing with clients when I was first starting at Equinox, <sighs> it was hot garbage. Like, yeah, of course, embarrassing, yeah. which you have to go through that process. But I'm like, oh, yes. the, these people are definitely much further along and have better information than I had with the access to the Internet and yep. a lot of the things that we have now that we didn't have at that time. Right. Yeah. There's, I was just YouTubing and like looking at bodybuilding.com. Yeah. You know? Yeah, T Nation. Yes. T Nation. T -Nation. Yeah. Shout out to T Nation. <laughs> Shout out to T Nation. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the resources that people have now are definitely way better, but it's I still see a lot of my way or the highway type stuff where it's like yeah. what you need to learn over time by coaching different people is that like you don't know it all and you won't ever know it all. I'm I think probably, that's the, ahead, I think that's the problem with like I know when I was this age like the 22 to 25 range like you've done it for like five years or whatever so you're kind of at that dangerous age where like you think you figured it out because you got progress and then i think the most dangerous trainer around is like a 25 year old who thinks they know everything yeah, yeah. and just lacks the reps and practice with other people um for sure yeah it's a i was a wild person back then <laughs> but i have a question tim and i were talking about this the other day what are some things like when you first started training that you thought were dumb and now like they're a big part of your program now or things you include building. now. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, that's also the Equinox speaking where like, if you're drinking the Equinox Kool-Aid in any way, which I wasn't heavily drinking it, but, but you were sipping but a little I was bit. Definitely you're sipping, sipping for a while. Um, <laughs> And I, I was just so anti machines, anti anything bodybuilding rep ranges really. Well, that's not true. I would do like, I like to live in the eight to 12 sure. range for most of my general population. And it worked well for them. And I was doing still a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now with them, but I now have completely kind of done a 180 around yeah. bodybuilding for people that are trying, obviously trying to put on some muscle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yes. thinking back about that where it's like what people wanted was they wanted to gain some muscle. They wanted to look good. They wanted yeah. to feel good. Uh -huh. And in my Equinox brain, I was like, oh, that means they need to like do their FMS and right. they need to be able to uh, like goblet squat to this. Much. You know what I mean? Just yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, and we're going to do a chop and we're going right. to we're going to make sure that rotary stability is on point and like your shoulder mobility is x y or z so you can't do this exercise yeah no overhead pressing for you right now exactly susan um <laughs> susan. yeah <laughs> yeah so um over time and i actually did a post about, about the fms in general where like by the end of even my equinox career i was like why why are we doing this yeah what is the point what is this telling people mm -hmm. why am i putting people on the in-body 
that are immediately coming to me because they have body image issues. Like let's, <gasps> let's measure, reinforce it. Yeah. Let's measure your body fat. It's right like, now. as a matter of fact, all that stuff you were really concerned about coming in here, this piece of paper tells me that is in fact the truth. Yeah. <laughs> you are out of shape. Bad. And I mean, it's bad. Yeah. You should buy training now. But that's, yeah. Over time, I think you just learn that stuff that, yeah. you know, just because it's being fed to you as the thing that you're supposed to be doing doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for you as a coach or your clients. Um, and yeah, bodybuilding now is like such a huge part of my own training and mm -hmm. what I program for my clients all the time. So, and so to that point, you know, there's something to be said about walking the walk and doing it. Um, and you've been training hard for a long time now. So can you touch a little bit on how training yourself has impacted you and helped make you a better coach. Somebody said to me once, like, would you go to a dentist that doesn't brush their teeth? Um, yeah. <laughs> a broke financial advisor. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think that applies to training. If somebody doesn't, isn't able to follow a training program or it hasn't ever really had those real experiences of a, like going hard and yeah getting in the pain cave with certain <laughs> shit where like, I don't trust. Yeah. I don't tr really trust a coach that I know doesn't do that stuff. Yeah. And it's not to say that you couldn't have the information that you sure. can't necessarily be a good coach without those things. But yeah, the experience that I've had over the years of trying different stuff, a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. a lot of, yeah, feeling like this is the thing. And then a couple years later being like, Oh wait, that's wow. I wasted two years. Not the thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> Um, but there's so much to learn in those yeah. failures, too. And you are your uh, what's that? Your own your guinea, own guinea pig? pig. Yeah. Yeah. It's like in, in the study where it's like it's you're the you're the subject of your own study yes. all the time. Sure. Um, and yeah, anytime I want to implement something, the first thing that I'm going to do is just try it myself. 100 percent. And, I, you know, I've throughout the years, so I'm, I'm like a. I'm a program nerd. You know, I've spent a lot of money buying other coaches programs and stuff because I like to learn. I like to do it. I like to try new stuff. And I can tell pretty quickly that if I get a program and I do it, I'm like, this person has clearly never done this themselves. <laughs> yeah. This is fucking absurd, you know? Yeah. Um, or there's like, you know, you get halfway through it. And it's like, no, no one, no one test drove this. No, no. This takes three hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I, with my own program, cause ladder, it goes 365 days a year. Um, so it's not just like a 12 week PDF program or mm -hmm. whatever. So I'm not doing my own programming all the time. All of the things that I program for them, I've done at yes. some point, sure. but I do like to go in there and, and do a workout here and there just to make sure things are like flowing. And occasionally I'll do one and I'll be like, Oh, no. Yeah, what, what was, was I, I thinking? thinking? Yeah, why? What's going on in my life them? when I was doing this? <laughs> I just did an update. So to your point, I just did an update on my program, Cheat Code. And it was the same thing where it's like, I think it was like a, a hinge day. And I got about three quarters of the way through and I was like, I'm cutting this, these yeah. accessories in half. I'm yeah. lit up. Yeah. <laughs> like I, if I can't handle this, these high school kids that are buying this program, they've got no shot. No Absolutely. chance. No chance. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you got to be honest with yourself about that stuff too, which is, by the way, another amazing quality that you have. So, um, well, before I get into to that, I'm going to shelf it. So you had your time at Equinox mm -hmm. and then you go through this transition period. Can you talk about what was next after Equinox? Yeah. Um, COVID was really the turning point for me. And I know a lot of people have similar stories where in Boston, we really shut down. Gyms were closed. Ev everything was closed. You couldn't go anywhere for a while. Um, and so when Equinox closed, all, none of my clients had anywhere to go. So we almost all of us started training virtually. So I would just see them on Zoom or FaceTime and they would have like a mini band and a single dumbbell and we would make it work. Yeah. And that's what I did for a while. But I also became aware at that point that like we didn't know how long. I mean, we thought it was going to be like a couple weeks, yeah, two weeks, one month. Yeah. And after a little bit, 
I became increasingly more aware of that. Maybe we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't, I don't know how long my clients are going to want to FaceTime and do a single dumbbell workout. So I have to start trying to figure something else out. And I had a lot of extra time because (laughs) I was at home 24 seven. And so I just started doing a little more social media stuff. And so a lot of my old content is very COVID centric where it was like, I only had, I think like two kettlebells and a Peloton. That's all I had all throughout COVID. And so most of my content there was just like, all right, what can we do with Mm -hmm. this minimal equipment? And I started posting like every day and, or every other day with just little kettlebell workouts that I would do. And once I moved here, it was like on my patio. That was my thing was I would, the only space I had to work out was my little patio. And it just started to grow and people started catching on and liking it. And it was a little bit of a right place, right time thing, I think. Yeah. Where now, obviously my people still ask me like, oh, why don't you do kettlebell only workouts anymore i'm like because i don't need to i gotta hold you yeah yeah i don't because i don't don't have to to just work out on my patio yeah Yeah. you don't need to either (laughs) things things have changed and i still love the kettlebell and i still do a lot of work with it but yeah that was a moment in time for me but that was the turning point i'm really grateful for all of that so then totally I, i was just like what do i do with this like do i make a program do i so i wrote my first pdf program i had my best friend who's a graphic designer who had never done that before. She was like, what do you mean? Like, what do you want it to look like? I don't even know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Just girl has never something. stepped foot in a gym. Kylie, <laughs> I couldn't even, couldn't drag her kicking and screaming <laughs> into a gym. So she doesn't know what a training program looks like. Right. Just put it in some grids and like make it look nice. So, and she nailed it, by the way. She did. Um, she's a professional. So yeah. she, yeah, I had faith that she could do it. And so, yeah, right, right before I moved to Austin was when I released my first PDF program. And I had, I think, 10,000 followers on Instagram, wow, which is crazy. a huge fucking deal to me. I, yeah. and like, I remember at the time my sister and like my sister's friends were like, oh my God, like you got, and at the time you could only, remember when if you could only swipe up on a, if you got to 10,000, oh, yeah. 10, yes. And I was like, yes, I can swipe I can, up. Get the swipe up. <laughs> I was so excited. Um, I and feel it was like 10K is the coolest number that you get to. It, 100%. And like after that, like I don't have near as big a following as you guys, but I feel like once I got to 10K, I was like, wow, I'm doing something. And then after that, I'm like, I don't really care. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, 10K was so exciting. Um, and yeah, I don't know how many of those programs I sold, but enough that I was like, oh, wow. I, ah. yeah, light, this is a light bulb moment where this could actually serve as some really good passive income mm-hmm. and potentially uh, an escape plan from doing Zoom sessions for my entire day. Right. Um, yeah. So that was kind of the start of it all what, the pivot what would you say to like coaches who are like they want to get started so like when you first the first day you're like you know what, i'm gonna post a workout video like what was going through your head did you have anything where you're like i want to do this um or you're like hell yeah like let's do this this looks fun or any like reservations like that totally so when i had my account actually for a while before it was originally called coffees and kettlebells nice and i it, because it was an idea to just like have something fun for me because a I love coffee and mm-hmm. I would like it's I, true shout out to coffee shout, shout out, out coffee. big shout out coffee and <laughs> I would go to different coffee shops and like try different coffees so that was like part of the account but it was not with the intention it was only people I knew that followed it and like I didn't want to post workout content <laughs> are you okay that really got me <laughs> the shout out the shout, shout out, out to coffee. coffee the shout out to coffee was yeah. like that was good yeah um And it mostly was that I didn't want to post workout content on my personal page because I was embarrassed. I didn't want to. And honestly, like my boyfriend at the time was like super weird about it. Like 
if I filmed myself in the gym, he would like give me a lot of shit about it. Shout out to insecure boyfriends. Shout out. Shout out, yeah. shout out <laughs> big insecure. Shout out ex-boyfriends. Yeah. Who's laughing now? <laughs> gotcha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like really I, I felt pretty insecure about it. It was also really taboo to be like filming yourself in the gym at that time. Absolutely. Like, True. Nobody had tripods. Yep. Nobody I would lean my phone up against something. Discreetly. Anybody looking? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um so there were definitely yeah. reservations about it. But at this point in time, that's not really something that I think most people worry about. I'm sure when you're first getting started, it's a little weird. Now, I've, it's so funny to think about how I felt even like a year ago with a tripod. Now I like march in with my fucking giant yeah. camera and yeah. giant Microphone. tripod. Film and crew, like, let's go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for coaches that are getting started out... Well, uh, yeah, the one thing is like, are you a coach or are you like an influencer? Yeah. Like that you kind of have to distinguish what you want to be. And that can be tough because you're potentially rewarded a little bit more for just going like the straight up influencer route where yeah. it's like, how can I just get eyeballs on my page, which is valuable. Like you, I feel like you kind of learned this lesson where like with the pros and some of the posts that you did yeah. where you're just like oh, I get sort of what the formula is. And once you can get the eyeballs on your page, then you can provide value to them. So yeah. you have to have a little bit of both of the the clickbait, not in a bad way, but like, how do I get people's attention and how do I keep it enough that maybe they go to my page and they see what I have to offer? Um, so I think you kind of have to decide what your lane is. Do I just want to post workouts? Do I just want to post inspirational stuff like what am i what am i providing to people is it education is it inspiration is it my, my body looks good is what are what is that and you kind of have to lean heavy heavily into that mm -hmm. and yeah you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take so like keep posting keep doing it and like but it can't be aimless. That's the I think that's the biggest difference now where i feel like when i was getting started not that my stuff was aimless it was pretty actually kind of niche mm -hmm. um but i do feel like at that time you could kind of just like the quality was so low yep. i look at those old videos they're like grainy and yeah. shitty and like you could kind of just post whatever and if you were consistent and you got people to to kind of buy in then it would work now you have to put a little more thought into it so posting consistently is important but actually finding your real voice and finding the type of content that not only you want to produce but people want to consume and it, that can be a hard balance to strike i think you know you touched on something that was such a turning point for me like i remember you know being a trainer um and feeling like i knew a little bit and i would see trainers or coaches on instagram with big followings and for whatever reason in my mind i only thought oh you know i'd see someone with big following be like oh they're an influencer and, you know, and therefore that means that they don't, they're not really a good coach and they don't know what they're doing. And I kind of would look at my phone with my 500 followers <laughs> and my, and showing up to work and working in the gym 50 hours a week and just being a miserable human, but I got it done. And I would look at that phone and I would come up from it from like a place of superiority. Of course. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a moral high ground. It's like, I'm not going to be one of these dumb Instagram yeah, people. Post on the internet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? Uh, and like, and then I had this experience and because of COVID and shot big shout out. Well, I was going to say shout out COVID. Don't maybe do that. maybe oh. not. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, we want this to get aired. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe what I mean to say. Shout out to like, coffee. Shot, yeah. Shout out coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, shout out like my life being disrupted though. Because like if it weren't for all of that happening, like I, I like you wouldn't have been forced to rethink like what is it that I want? Mm -hmm. What is it that I want to do? And like is this the path I'm continuing on th what I want long term for myself? Yeah. And then I sh shout out David Gray. That's much better than my previous shout out. <laughs> um, I watched him in that same time period go from like 2000 followers. He got on Just Fly sports performance podcast shout out just fly and then david he just erupted and he put out a pdf program and took off and I, and that that's what inspired me to say like oh like i i know that i have value and i can put stuff out there that's helpful and useful and then it shifted from being like looking 
at Joel Seedman and just being like, what an idiot. <laughs> and yeah, you can look at it two ways. Yeah. You can look at it from a position of saying this person is no different than I am. Yes. In fact, I feel like I have more to offer than this person. Exactly. So I'm going to do the work and I'm going to make the effort to put myself out there. Or I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be a fucking keyboard warrior yep. and I'm just going to be pissed about it. Yep. And I'm going to keep working my 50 hour a week training job mm. and I'm going to be miserable. Yep. Well, it's like all the people in the comments like hating on Joel Seedman or whatever. It's like, well, you live um, in your parents' basement <laughs> and he's making a shit ton of money selling. So programs. much so like, money. Well, you can disagree with his training all you want. And, the, like, tr and the tactics yeah. he uses to maybe acquire some of totally. the financial gain and attention, sure. right? We can we can cast it, but from a marketing perspective, yeah. guy's a genius marketer. <laughs> guy, the guy does this, and you know, selling programs, selling slang and programs. Dude. Yeah, I I like uh, sometime in my Equinox career followed Joel Seedman, mm -hmm. and yeah like it was before he went full crazy i think yeah it's gotten a little more unhinged over time. well you you gotta you start running out of material at some point when that's <laughs> your lane true. you know you find a lane that and that that's the irony of building your own business or your own network is that if you don't do it with integrity or you you do it in a way that's outside of yourself then you constantly have to seek things outside of yourself to get the same result yeah um so you got to kind of come up with the next craziest thing like sure. standing on a bench holding two trap bars in each hand with yes. chains on it and only squatting to 90 degrees because somehow that's superior it's gonna translate it's yeah. gonna translate better duh yeah i and that's it's not it that applies to not only the strength and conditioning space but just like the influencing space in general mm -hmm. where it's like what's the next thing that's going to get people to buy in is it fucking gut health or is it cortisol levels or mm -hmm. is it whatever and the the non-glamorous answer is that like none of those things are necessarily right or wrong yeah. like you don't have to squat ass to grass you can squat to parallel you can't you know it's yes. like but being the it is what it is guy it's yeah. not what people are looking for they're looking for somebody to be like you can only squat here's your degrees. answer and this it. is this why. is the silver bullet yeah like people really want you to make those decisions for them it's not fun for them to hear you say like well yeah you could do it this way if that feels better for you right or you could like that's not what people are looking no for. not at all because you know then then you have responsibility over the outcome yeah you know, if, if you tell me you have to do X, Y, Z and it's going to guaranteed get you this outcome and then you do it and it doesn't work, well, it's not entirely your fault, you know. Right. But can you, so having integrity throughout navigating social media and growing, because um, we, you know, we've probably pointed to some examples of where like maybe that isn't the priority. But I've known you and I've watched you grow and I've watched you go from, you know, a small following, relatively small following to where you are now on Instagram and TikTok to having massive platforms and you've stuck to your guns and you've up upheld your integrity. And it's been really awesome to watch you do that and continue to grow in that way. So can you talk about your experience with that? Yeah, it, I think it can be hard because you see people that I wouldn't necessarily categorize the same way of prioritizing their integrity. It's, and at the end of the day, everybody's out here to make their bag, make their money and do their thing. Mm -hmm. And I am not going to lose sleep over it. It's not anything I ever want to participate in, but I also, I don't have like a lot of hate toward people that do their thing on social media. But what can be hard as somebody that wants to maintain a certain level of, of coaching integrity and keep the trust of your audience is that you see people doing the things that will grow your following more and will. What are some examples of that? Like what are, what are, what are some of the most on the nose examples of people just kind of willing to do or say things that um i mean the the one that we would all know is like fit tea or like things that like right that we just know don't work but are so 
alluring to a certain population that just don't know any better. Right. And that's the piece of it that I think that a lot of the influencers are unwilling to acknowledge is that they're truly misleading people. Like, I think we think, oh, people know better. They know that that's not really true. And it's just a way to get them into to buy the tea or to buy my program or to buy my X, Mm -hmm. Y, or Z. When in reality, like from being on social media for a long time, I know that a large piece of the population doesn't know anything. They don't know shit about shit. Yeah. And yeah, they'll buy. If you tell them this is going to make you lose 10 pounds in two weeks, they will buy it. They will do it. Well, nobody wants to hear like the things we know that's true. It's like consistency of sleep, nutrition, hydration habits, but like nobody wants that. Cause to look like Kelly Matthews, you have to, how long have you been training for? Mm, 12 years. So it's like to look like Kelly, you need to do this for 12 years, 12 years consistently. And the sexy stuff like that stuff's like the cake. Right. And then the frosting is all the little 1% things that if you're not doing the cake part, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Uh, people like, okay, maybe it's, I can't get this cause my hormones are out of whack or I don't have this tea or I'm not on this certain supplement mm-hmm. and people that do it long enough. Like we've tried all the pre-workouts, we've tried all the diet hacks and whatnot. And then you come back to the basics. But the issue is like the, the basics aren't sexy. Like, They're not sexy. It's just consistency. It's the bell time. curve. You know, yeah. you start off, you're like, I'm just going to hammer these uh, same seven to ten movements as hard as possible till I'm st- I'm tired and I want to go home. And then it's like you know you ramp up and you think you know something, and then you come back down the other side and you're like, oh, yeah, uh, what I was doing before is fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's there's just so much of that, and and specifically within exercise, it's I, I think like targeting vulnerable populations like new moms or, mm-hmm. you know, like people that are overweight or that want to lose weight or pe- that you, your insecurities around your body make you an extremely vulnerable population. And that coupled with not being educated and understanding that you can't spot reduce fat and that the fit tea isn't going to make you lose your like mom pooch and stuff like that. Like, it's just, you're you're preying on people's insecurities and you're making money off of that. And yeah. that's that's the piece of it that I, you know, you see it work and you see why it works and yep. how easy it would be to do that. Yeah. And that, you know, maybe if I started marketing like that, like I'd have a million followers on on Instagram and maybe I would have. Yeah. But I would feel like shit. I would feel it's way, way more important to me that my audience can trust me. And I'm not always going to get it right. As we know, like things change. Like, the, yep. again, the, the training tactics that I was using five years ago are not the same things I'm using mm-hmm. now. And a lot of the things that I said then were probably wrong. Yeah. And that's OK, because I'm willing to like if somebody was like, hey, you said this, I'd be like, yeah, I, you know, I, I know. evolved. Uh, yeah, I know differently now. <laughs> yeah. I learned. Yeah, and, I did this thing called uh, learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's OK. Yeah. But. I, yeah, I want my audience to be able to trust me. I also want to attract the type of people that don't want any bullshit. Like yeah, if you want to, sure. if you want to buy into that stuff, that's fine. Eventually you're probably going to come around to a place where you realize that those three things didn't work for you the way that you thought they were going to. And then you can find somebody that has a platform that actually provides you information that's valuable to you. Right. So what's the next step in your story? I started working at Collective. hmm and I met Tim Riley training. It was the best day of my life. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, the catalyst for love. That's well, right. so I nothing see- like finding love at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a tail love is on his workplace. Top. Yeah, love, love with your coworker. Shitting where you eat. Um, <laughs> something you should do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they say. There's no HR issues there. <laughs> Good thing we don't have an HR department. <laughs> yes. Um, Shout out no HR. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I was still, um, my life when I moved to Austin, looking back on it now, was so relaxing and leisurely. Like I had, I think I had maybe six or seven clients, Mm -hmm. but my, to give you an idea of the difference between the cost of living in Boston and in Austin, I was paying $2,000 a month for a less than 400 square foot apartment. And I was like scraping by kind of, um, and when I got my first apartment in Austin, I think I was paying a little under fifteen hundred dollars 
a month and or like 13, something like that. So comparative, I was like, oh my God. And it was twice the size of my apartment. So like what I was doing with my virtual sessions covered my bills and plenty for me to like do the things that I wanted to do. So I was training like three sessions a day. I would go to the gym for like two or three hours and it's the American dream. Right? Yeah, it really like, American would, like, dream. Lucy and I would go for long walks. Lucy is her dog to be clear. And yeah. yeah, my life was incredible, but I was like kind of lonely. So, and I missed that like in-person piece of yeah. training and having coworkers and having clients. And, you know, I didn't really know anybody in Austin. Other and finding than, out devastatingly handsome boyfriend. Yeah. Hot Where boyfriend. was I going to find a guy like, like me? <laughs> Not online. No. Not, no. Not online. Not just anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. And, but it was also like, we were still in a weird time of, of co it was still COVID and it was like pre vaccine. And I don't know. I was just kind of like waiting until I felt comfortable enough to be in an in-person environment. And so I started looking around, seeing what my options were. I got a few calls from Equinox once they opened up down here and I was like, no chance. Yeah. I can't do it. Um, but I, yeah, like I looked at a few other local gyms and I was actually close to accepting a position at another gym and it just like wasn't feeling good. I was just like, I don't know, like this just feels weird. I don't I don't think it's like all the way a fit, but it feels like my only option right now. And I really want to be coaching people in person. Um, and then Jeremy got in touch with me. Um, Who is Jeremy? Jeremy Hills, the one of the co-founders of Collective, got in touch with me. And this was before um, Collective opened and mm -hmm. he invited me in. They were still doing construction in there. And he said, I need a female coach. And I said, I only want to work part time. Uh, this is for me to just be able to have some clients and have a place to be like, I'm never going to be doing 10 sessions a day. So that's not that's not me. And he's like, cool, don't care, whatever. Perfect. So I declined the position at the other gym and started at collective. And at the time there were no members, there were no, there was no equipment. <laughs> like there's nothing in there. So we were all just kind of shooting the shit for a mm -hmm. while. Me, you, Eric Krakowski. Honestly, those were, I knew kind of at that time, I was like, man, these are the these these are the best days. Yes, oh, yeah. because we like knew. we yeah. knew that the that the those days were numbered because it, sure. it was it was really special. It, we were part of this exciting thing that it was pretty evident that it was going to have some success. We had all left position. We were all coming from places that we had our time had expired. We 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 had had enough, and now we're in this environment where it's new, and we there were kind of no rules, and like there was a lot of downtime. You know, we're which I think sealed ball. sealed the deal on Kelly and I ended up being getting together um, was all the downtime. Yeah, we'd be playing spike ball in the middle of the turf for hours. Not yeah. a bad day. No, so great fun. day. Clock in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then I started at Collective. I still coach there three days a week for like two or three hours. <laughs> and now, you know, I... I took a position at a company called Ladder, and I am a full-time coach there. So I have a program of we're creeping up on eleven thousand members. Incredible! Can you shout out the program name for those who don't well, know? Limitless. Limitless on Ladder. Limitless <laughs> on the platform Ladder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. That's still crazy to me that I'm coaching. 10,000 people. Yeah. Um, so I'm just really, I'm grateful that I'm able to, to do that. And it feels, it feels good to be coaching and be making a difference in people's lives. And I'm able to see it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a huge motivator to keep going. Cause with making content, doing social media, it, for me, ebbs and flows in how I feel about it. Yeah. Some days I'm like, I don't want to fucking make content. I don't want to do this. I don't have any ideas. I don't feel inspired. And having the real everyday interaction with people that are actually getting something out of mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And it's not just like, what does my body look like? What a, like, sometimes it feels like that where you're just like, oh, I'm just feeding people bullshit. But 
I'm not. And people are actually getting something out of it. And I'm actually coaching real people that are making real progress and doing things that they were never able to do before. And doing it on that scale is so special to me. So most of your career, you've, you've worked in person. You still work in person. So you've, you, you're, you've always, you've never not done that. Um, but over the course of the past, I guess, two plus years now with Ladder, right? Is that year, how long it's been? A year and a half. Not, not even two years yet. Yeah. What have you learned about training people online, you know, from when you really started and then now you're, you know, 11,000 members, people that you train. What are some of the lessons you've learned about training and how has it made you a better coach? Lessons I've learned are that people really like to have their hand held. Yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah. And I... I'm I'm pretty blunt when it comes to stuff like that. And like, I think one thing I can offer people is like, you are perfectly capable of using your brain and modifying when you need to modify or when you don't have access to a piece of equipment, don't do it. Like stuff yeah. like that where I'm like, oh my God, everybody just gets in their head so badly and, yeah. and they're just like, I have to do it. So exactly much anxiety. The way. And it's like, no, the more time you spend in the gym, the more time you run a program. And like, it's so evident in the people that have been on my program for since the beginning, because they, we have a big group chat and that's where people can ask questions and voice concern, anything that they need. And so a lot of new people will ask the questions that they have and the people that have been on the team will answer the questions for me. Oh, like, that's nice. Right. Where, yes. yeah, where I don't even have to do it anymore. Yeah. And, and like, those are the big things that I feel like it's not even necessarily, of course, the coach, the coaching is a really player led nice. team right there. Yeah. We're, we're like, yes, I'm, I'm coaching them and they're getting value in the gym, but they're also building a skill set and confidence around the gym and around their body and their own ability to do that. Like I would love for people to be able to leave my program and program for themselves. Yeah. Like if they, if they can do that, I'm doing my job, yeah, right? Like right. I'm giving them enough information where, you know, they're not necessarily going to be an expert, but they know how those things are put together and why. Um, and that's, I feel like the skill set that I've developed over time with online training where it's like, I'm not just giving these people a workout for them to go and do it and and just not think. And that's for that's what some people want. But a lot of people are able to build true competence in the gym, which is huge, I think. So I want to I'm just like thinking about, you know, the entire scope of everything you've done going from Equinox to where you're at now to having like this massive um, online presence between the ladder app, TikTok, Instagram. This is, I know a loaded question, but if you could give people three things right now to start their social media journey, to get to a place where you're at right now, what are three things that's like the, the Kelly Matthews starter pack to Ooh. get to where you're at? Find your specific voice and what you want to communicate to people. What do you want them to know about you? And what you do you want them to know about what your platform is going to offer them? And go hard in the paint on that. Um, <laughs> that's one. Two, um, don't get discouraged. It's hard. Mm. And it's saturated. Everybody yeah. and their fucking cousin <laughs> wants to be... An influencer yeah. now. And I get it. Um, but it, it's it's becoming harder and harder to set yourself apart and to grow an audience. But you're definitely not going to if you just give up because your posts aren't doing well. Yeah. So don't get discouraged and be as consistent as you can. Um, and if you're a coach, for a coach that's trying to get started, education. Like the more information you can offer people and the more you can actually prove that you know your shit, yeah. the more likely it is that people will end up gravitating toward your platform. 100%. Because, you know, th you see people that have a whole lot of followers because they look good or they, you know, they do a good job of producing clickbaity content, whatever it is. But they're not getting the same return on that as somebody that actually builds like a real community. Yeah. And this is a real thing that like 
even brands look at. Like you might have a million followers mm-hmm. and then I look at your engagement and I look at 800 likes. Exactly. <laughs> Zero and then, saves. And then I might, <laughs> and then I might have 50,000 followers. Yeah. But people are commenting, they're yep. engaging, and yep. guess what? Those people are buying from you. Because if they trust you, they're interacting with you, they care, they feel connected to you, they actually feel like they're part of your community. I would rather have those 50,000 people than have those million people. It makes a huge difference to actually build community with your audience. Well, and you've definitely built that if you can have 11,000 people on a program and with, you know, people love to criticize and everything. And if your program was crap, like there wouldn't be 11,000 people on it anymore. No. You know what I mean, so it's like people love it. Yeah. I come to the gym, quick side story. <clears throat> <laughs> so at this point in my life, I'm Kelly Matthews boyfriend. And I know that because I'll be at the place where I work, not the location she works, where I work. And mostly women who I've never met will come up to me and ask me, is Kelly here? And I'll say no. And they're like, you are Kelly Matthews' boyfriend, right? And I'll say, yes. And, say, <laughs> and it's always followed Hell with, yeah. oh my God, I love Kelly so much. I do her program on ladder. It's the best. When is she here? Well, I have a similar story. So when we were at uh, UT training and we like posted what we were all training together. All my messages were, I had like a bunch of DMs. I was like, oh wow, cool. Maybe they like the training. They're like, you know, Kelly Matthews. You know Kelly Matthews? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, Tim and I were working out too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I guess somebody cares about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we've got two. So find your voice, you know, d- find your voice. Try not to get discouraged. Stay consistent. Three was build your community. And three is build your community. Yeah, like educate yourself and build your community. Okay. So here's a question. So education wise, are you a books person? Are you a, I need to practically do something? Are you a seek out other coaches that do something at a high level person? Like what's your best route for education? I'm glad you asked that because I get questions all the time about the fact that I have a coach. People think it's like weird. And they'll say like, well, if you're a coach, why do you need a coach? Which I think is the silliest question people yeah, could ask course. because there are few things that I've gotten more value from than having a coach for myself. And honestly, for most of my training career, I couldn't afford to have an in-person coach mm-hmm. the way that I do now. So it's a luxury, but I also, like you, have bought countless training programs yeah. and eBooks and stuff like that so that I can go through, even if I'm not gonna run the program myself, people that I really respect and that I think like I see what they're doing and I think they they get it, yeah. I wanna see how their programs 100%. are laid out and what they're doing with mm-hmm. people and the kind of results that their clients are getting. So that I would say is my preferred version of education. And again, like having my own coach that just comes from a totally different, although he spent a lot of time at Equinox too. Like we're, <laughs> we're like sort of polar opposites in a lot of ways where like he's a, he's a bodybuilder, he's a power lifter too, but like total nerd and has uh, the level of education that he has is head and shoulders above what I have. And I reap the benefits of that because I get to like soak it in every session and every time he's breaking down the program for me and why we're doing what we're doing and how we're going to build up to my next meet and how all of those things that because I've never coached that and I've never really studied it because I didn't I've never had a powerlifting client what do I need to do that for so now I have this whole other piece that I never really had before and it's super valuable so you're working with this powerlifting coach Ryan I love Ryan it's <laughs> so He's just the best. Um, he looks like if like a manta ray and a and like a minotaur had a baby. Yeah, he is just you. you I, I, we're gonna get a photo. We're gonna get this clip yeah, to get a photo he, of he Ryan. Like, trains. This guy works out. He looks like he's doing a lat spread all the time. All the, time. the guy he has lats. If if the wind blows too hard, he'll take off like a kite. He's yeah. actually he's probably he's he's he too muscularly yeah, yeah, dense yeah. <laughs> for that to happen. Thank God. Um, but so you've started a powerlifting journey, which is awesome because you, when we met, that wasn't even on your radar. No. So t- take us through that. How awesome. I got to go to your meet and watch. By the way, she won. 
Best overall lifter. No big deal. At her first meet. I felt like I was just such a proud boyfriend, <laughs> like taking pictures of her and stuff. That's Kelly's boyfriend. Yeah, there. yeah. Look, oh, how sweet. He's taking photos of her <laughs> and carrying all her stuff. You are a good Instagram boyfriend in those moments. Yeah. I appreciate you. You, know, um, you got to know your role, guys. Yeah, I wanted to compete in something again. And I feel like for a while I was sort of just spinning my wheels around doing the stuff that I liked to do and not doing any programs and not having any sort of direction with my training other than I just want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, which is fun. And I think sort of necessary sometimes when you've been phases. Yeah. Like I think when you've been working out for a long time, like you're going to go through phases where you just kind of do whatever and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but I was, I got to the point where I was like, I got to do something. I got to train for something. I got to compete in something. Cause also during those times with lifting where I was kind of like laissez faire about it, I was like doing Muay Thai or I was doing jujitsu and I was like competing in something. And that's where I would focus my energy and like lifting was just what I did for fun. By the way, real quick. Yeah. Her jujitsu experience. She has this really cute thing where occasionally she'll come up and get me in a surprise rear naked choke. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not like, you know, ha ha rear naked. No, it's like, no, I'm fighting for my life right now in the middle of the kitchen. Didn't put the dishes away. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh huh. It's fun. If you haven't tried it, let's choke your boyfriend out real quick. She, she's never choked me out to be clear. All right. Keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I just kind of decided, I was like, I think I want to do a powerlifting meet. And I was really intimidated by it because it feels like one of those things that if you can't lift like a fucking Olympian, I don't belong at, right. a, at a powerlifting Yeah, because you see meet. on Instagram, it's like, you know, someone at 135 pound body weight squats 705 pounds. 100%. Like, I can't fucking powerlift. <laughs> at all. And, and My then, total. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I just was like, whatever. I'm just going to, I'm going to try it. I think I'll have a lot of fun with it. And you suggested Ryan to yeah. me. And we trained for... I don't know, like six or seven months before my first before my first meet and going to my first meet was one of my favorite experiences ever, because you learn as soon as you walk in the door that it's nothing like that, that there's people of all different skill and experience levels, weights like you're some people yeah, are getting there and they're lifting 135, they're deadlifting 135 mm -hmm. and like that's their PR and they're fucking pumped about it. And that's yeah. awesome. And the crowd cheers. And everybody's and awesome. hyping you up and yeah. like everybody's just there to have a good time and do the best that they can. And it's, a, it's my motto. It's a really <laughs> have a good time. Have a good time. Let's have a good time. <laughs> do the best um, you can. And and that is other power lifters have said the, be, the the same thing about it, where they're just like, it's just a really supportive community and everybody loves to see everybody succeed. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about powerlifting, you should do it. It's so fun. So with that, so you started powerlifting. Obviously, you've lifted for a long time, but your background isn't powerlifting. So you probably come into that a um, little intimidated, um, unsure about what's going on. Has that helped you relate to like your clients that come in that have never worked out and are kind of nervous about everything? Like you can kind of empathize, empathize with them. Empathize is the right word. Yeah. We got this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's something that I think we can, I'm sure you feel this training athletes all the time where like you get to a level where now my in-person clients, I've been training for I haven't taken a new client in like two years. <laughs> I, I just, Shout out to retention. I have, <laughs> yeah, I have my people and they like they come, they know the drill, but it is it's easy to like lose touch with that. And like when you're only training athletes, these people, I'm sure you get some people that are like Bambi on ice, especially because you coach basketball. Yeah. They're so tall. But um, most of the time in those scenarios, people know their way around the gym. They know what to do. So. Yeah, like getting in and, and doing stuff that is so uncomfortable for me at first and feeling, yeah, like feeling like I'm not good at it and feeling like I, I could fail at this. And I don't know why we're doing what we're doing, like the things that he knows I don't know, which I'm not. I don't love that. Like I was talking to <laughs> Alexis about this theater. She was like, I hate not knowing. Like I, I, I hate feeling dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to feel dumb. Yeah. Sometimes sure. like I think it's smarter, important to yeah. feel to feel dumb, to feel like you're bad at something like you could fail at something because otherwise what makes it worth it to do? Like if you're just doing shit you're good at all the time. Yeah. 
gonna be well, you're putting boring. yourself out there, and I think like people talk about like if you're a coach, why would you have a coach? But like fitness is so like multifaceted, like yeah. strength, building muscle, um, you know, getting better at cardio or whatever. And it's like, why wouldn't you try to hire an expert in one of those areas to help enhance everything else? So do you yeah. find yourself like in your powerlifting phases, you program more strength stuff and you're uh, for your clients or anything like that? A little bit. Not not my in-person clients yeah. as much, um, but in Limitless, I will. But a lot of times that's because like people see I only have so much time. So like most of the time what's getting filmed is the stuff that I'm doing. It's mm -hmm. not right. it's not the stuff that's on my Limitless program. It's not, you know, workouts that I'm just making up for. It's what I'm doing, which as I get closer and closer to the meet is a lot of squat, bench, deadlift, squat, bench, deadlift, squat, bench, deadlift. But people see that and they want to do it. They're like, can we do more powerlifting training? Like I want to do what you're doing. And so, yeah, it does leak into that a little bit, but people have fun with it. I, I mean, I love it just because it shows like being strong is cool. Yeah. 100%. And like if you are a woman and lift weights and get strong, it's cool. You're going to look better and you're not going to look like you're powerlifting coach like yeah. even if you try can we talk about that real quick because no, like the, the classic the uh, a fear that i've had with a lot of particularly gen pop clients who are women is that you know we're talking about training how things like look they, they'll say something to the effect of well you know i want to get toned and i want to lose some fat and i, and I want to look and feel strong but i don't want to look like you and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, look like me. What you total look like? I, I I've spent my entire adult life trying to get yeah. here. Like you're gonna wake <laughs> up one morning and be like, holy shit, I have yeah. pecs and biceps. Like <laughs> I wish it was that easy, you know? You were eating a family sized bag of chips. I literally ate calories. a rotisserie a rotisserie chicken a day for five years of my life. Yeah. And that wasn't even on my anyway. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> I think we've moved in the right direction. You know. Yeah. I think you're you know, a pioneer of that for women and the fact that being strong and lifting to be strong and being capable is like this really fucking awesome, special thing. That piece is definitely very important to me. And, and this is sort of twofold because I think the narrative that we have all been fed for a really long time as women, as strength training has become more and more mainstream and popular for women is don't worry you won't get bulky, which I get. I understand that sentiment, right? Where it's like, no, 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 you can strength train and you can stay skinny. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to use that verbiage because I would rather just say like strength train because you can yeah. and because getting bigger is not a bad thing. Like I've gained since the beginning of my strength training career, like I've gained probably 20 pounds. Right. Um, and I feel better in my body now than I did when I was 130 pounds. Yep. And to me, taking up more space and gaining muscle is like it, you have to work your ass off to do it, first yep. of all. So that's like a badge of honor, right? Like yep. I spent shit don't happen by accident. No, like I spent thing. the majority of my adult life trying to build this muscle yep. and I'm glad it weighs more and that it takes up more space and that I can lift heavier shit. Mm -hmm. And it that's, makes fighting your rear naked choke off a lot. I mean, yeah, I, yeah it's no joke. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah, I'm very proud of. And I, I, it's not for everyone. Yes. Not everyone wants to do bodybuilding. Not everybody wants to get bigger. And that's OK, too. I think that's a piece that like someone and get really sensitive about where they're just like, well, what if I don't, I don't want to look like you. That's fine. Don't. You don't, then don't. Yeah. Um, cool. And you can still strength train and, and not look like me. Yeah. But I think just always feeding that same narrative to women where it's like, don't worry, you won't get bulky. Don't worry. And it's like, well, no, if you try hard enough, you, you could. will, you could, you could, if it mattered that much. Yeah. To you. And, if but you, you want to. And a lot of times you find like you, whatever route you'd go to get into the gym, is a good route. So if you're if you're going there because you're like I'm a cardio bunny and I'm going to get on the tread and I'm going to like do this thing and then maybe you decide you want to dip your toe into strength training and you're only using two and a half pound weights and you're doing like 
whatever, like some bullshit program. And then you, you know what I mean? Like you start going deeper and deeper into the strength training pool where eventually you don't think about the fact that you want to be skinnier anymore. You're thinking about how can I eat enough protein? How can I, and I've seen that transition in so many women of going from wanting to be as small as possible and staying on the cardio machines or only using the two and a half pound weights to now they're full on doing like bodybuilding programs. Hell yeah. What do you think are some like advantages like for a woman putting on five to 10 pounds of muscle? Like what things have you noticed just besides getting stronger? Like, can you get away with more things in your diet? Are you able to do more activities you like doing? Like, what it, what, what does it do for you as a person? I definitely think that you have more nutritional flexibility when you have more muscle on your body. I think you guys can probably attest to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, shout out to Super Bowl food. Shout yeah. out. <laughs> Big shout out. <laughs> Yeah, you have you can have a little more flexibility in your diet. Um, yeah, I definitely feel proficient at more things. I feel more like I don't ever have to ask him to do anything for me, really. I'm well trained. Right. No, He's but like super I, high up. Uh, yeah. Other yeah, than. Yeah. Fall. Yeah. yeah. Me too, I have to ask him to do that. Too, yeah. too, so not a big deal. <laughs> um, but I do think that the the bottom line of that is that you work for that like when you put on five to ten pounds of muscle is not a small amount of muscle no. at all and i think and it's the same with performance-based goals where you're like i did that like that wasn't i didn't wake up one morning and i have biceps and delts like i worked in the gym for years probably yep um and that does more for your confidence than anything so it's kind of earned confidence like you put in the days, months, weeks, yeah. whatever. And people uh, recognize that oh, too. Yeah. Like yeah. people definitely see, especially women that have muscle on their body and they're like, I think such as a lot right. about you, like even outside of lifting, like if you, you know, look like you train consistently all the time, you're probably consistent in other places in your life. You're probably competitive in other places in your life. So mm -hmm. even if you did still train like this and worked, you know, at an office job, um, I'd probably be a little biased towards you because I'm like, well, she's got some consistency. Yeah. She's got some grit. I'd probably get know? more comments if I worked in a in an office environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think that it it and although all of those things don't always show in your body, like totally. there are plenty of women that train consistently that you know there are not super lean or are not and like, but there are still. Uh, What's the I can't remember the power lifter's name that she's like one of my favorite power lifters right now, but she she's a big girl, but she deadlifts like a fucking thousand pounds. Oh, I know who and you're talking like, about. She wears the big she, hoops. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I love her. And like that shit, like regardless of what your body looks like, being consistent and being able to perform in the gym will make you more confident. It's not going to solve all your problems. It's not going to like my my body dysmorphia has not disappeared because <laughs> yeah. I go to the gym. Um, but I can tell you, I feel a lot more confident in other areas of my life as a result of my ability to be consistent in the gym and like show up in that way. So back to the powerlifting thing, people want to know, what are the totals? What are we dealing with here? Um, <laughs> okay. What are the numbers? So my last meet, I squatted 315. Um, I benched 170.2. Whoa. I'm most, I knew your legs were strong, but. And then I deadlifted 325, I think. And then this upcoming meet, I haven't set specific goals yet, but I'm feeling pretty good this week. Actually, this is good timing because yeah. we're Hopefully. doing, we're like this week I'm doing singles at like a nine RPE. And then basically I'll be like maxing next week to get an idea of where I'm at. And I already, like I failed a squat. The only thing I failed at the meet was my squat and I failed a 320 or like 321 or something like that. So we're chasing that. That I should have gotten. Yeah. And I did it on Monday, like easy. See, it's cool. You failed and then you put in some more work and now uh, you. Yeah. She's, I, I, I saw the recording of it. She smoked it. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm getting excited. And I benched like not super well, but I benched 185 uh, yeah, like dude. a few weeks ago. And so I I'm joke, feeling... I'm going to have to start powerlifting because yeah. she's going to. Dude, I don't want to start out squatting me, dude. <laughs> I don't want to train with you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting really excited for this meet. I wasn't, I wasn't 
that confident. It's so funny with powerlifting training too. And this is why I really appreciate having a coach is because it takes so much patience Mm. and like, you're not like, I didn't, I didn't squat bench or deadlift for like a few months after the meet. And then when I started doing it, I was like, Oh my God, what happened? Like a week, all of that strength I feel like is gone. And so at the beginning of that process, I was like, I don't even feel like I'm going to be able to hit any PRs at this meet. Like what's happened. And now with good coaching and good programming, like I'm actually seeing, I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm hitting these numbers that I was shooting for at my meet easy at like an eight, nine RPE. And like, I haven't even tried to max yet. So that's cool. With powerlifting, have you uh, sort of like reframed your mindset of like, cause I feel like you're a workhorse as far as like volume intensity, a lot of things going on. And with powerlifting, you obviously have to do a set rest a substantial amount of time to do it again. Has that been kind of a thing to get used to or some workouts I've gotten, I had to get used to the length of the workout sometimes, like, cause there are some workouts that I'll be at the gym for two hours, but no, because I, I don't know if this is unique to my experience. Tim sees my Monday workout every week with Ryan and she's a monster. No, it, like, oh, yeah, she stuff, turns into I've seen her work out. I was like, no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, to, to put up with like she Ooh. as a as a Ryan, she's like, why am I doing this? Yeah. How many reps? <laughs> why? You know, like she's like, angry. We're, a very, we're a very good fit as coach and client because he just doesn't give a shit. He's like, you can you can complain as much as you want. You can. And I do like I I want to whine. While I'm like, if I'm doing shit, I don't want to do to give you an idea of what training has been for the last four (laughs) weeks. So pretty brutal. We'll do we'll work up to like a heavy single or a heavy set of three. And then we'll do a back down set on one of the main lifts on Monday. It'll be back squats. And then after that, it's been three sets of 15 to 20 with one minute of rest in between on the seated leg curl uh, pendulum squat leg extension and touch and go deadlifts 15 to 20. (laughs) You kind of probably like that though. I feel like you're kind of crazy. Uh, I am a little crazy, but like it's that tests my limits for sure. Where like you, it's basically, you might as well not have any rest. Like you're just doing 60 reps in a matter of four minutes. Um, so I'm always, even though the the volume and the intensity of the powerlifting work will vary, like sometimes, yeah, we're doing like a six, seven RPE on those lifts, but we're never like taking it easy on the accessory yeah. work. So I'm always. So at least get some of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's never easy. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't want it to be. <laughs> no. Yeah. And I, I'll see the condition that she's in after those workouts. And there are days where it's like, she's like, she can't. This is a two rotisserie chicken night. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It'll take me out sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. There are some days where I train and the rest of the day I'm like comatose. When I was doing 30 30s, that was, would ruin my whole day. Oh my God, I've been there. What's 30 30s for those playing at home? 30 30s are uh, a training protocol that are adapted from mass is the yep. name of the Pat program. Davidson. Davidson. Yeah. And basically did you do mass one or mass two or both. I did so them both. He yeah, did it. Back I've back. actually yeah. never done it as written. It like Ryan basically adapted it mm-hmm. so that it's not, it wasn't 10 exercises. It was like seven yeah. or something like that. Seven or eight. Um, but basically what you're doing is 15 reps of an exercise and you have to do those 15 reps in 30 seconds or under you get 30 seconds to rest before you start the next exercise. And in mass, it's 10 exercises total. Yes. You need a whole gym to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, it's a horrible experience. It does not make sense to do in a commercial gym whatsoever. You have to kind of have access to a lot of equipment at the same time. Um, but we would do, yeah, I think it was like six or seven exercises and you do, you end up doing f- like four or five rounds and it's just, so the basic gist is central. training density, hundred yeah. percent, a uh, tonnage and then tonnage per minute. I hundred percent. Yep. yep. And then you're trying to just improve your tonnage total workout to workout. Yeah. It's uh, not fun. I used no. to 
take some of my buddies who wanted to start lifting through that and be like, you still want to lift? Yeah. <laughs> that's how I could find people I wanted to train with. Right, yeah. If you could make through that, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I can, right. we could do yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. are like, nah, I'm kind of tired. I'm like, all right, let's not do this ever again. Kind of yeah. tired. <laughs> I would, back here. Yeah. I would, I would vomit every second or third. That's how you know it's working. And that's right, yeah. You just got to push it. No doubt. Um, all right, so, Kelly, we're coming up on time, but we've got a list of some things that we want to touch on before you go. Okay. So, Zach, I'll let you, I'll let you go first. Question number one. <clears throat> what do you see in the industry that you don't like or things that kind of perturb you? <laughs> perturb me. I think dogma mm -hmm. in, in fitness and people just thinking that one thing is the, the thing that's going to fix you. Or even if they don't believe that, they want to sell it to you. I'm going to keep my answers brief. Mm. So that's my answer. Okay. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, what are some th things that you're seeing right now that you're like, I love this? How many women are in the gym? I think that's a big piece. And for better or worse, I think bodybuilding. There are some pieces of bodybuilding that are working their way into mainstream fitness that I'm like, you guys don't really need to be adopting this piece of, of bodybuilding. But I think like the popularization of gaining muscle is overall a really good thing and seeing so many women that are now in the gym and like really lifting makes me really happy i feel like you're one of the catalysts for that which thank you because this makes my job a lot easier <laughs> i train mainly women um zach I, and uh, how much do you is that something that you struggle with because for those of you who don't know zach works he's the head strength coach at uh, the University of Texas women's basketball. Um, is that something you run into at the collegiate level with your athletes? I think the biggest thing is like the education piece on the why. And like you were saying, when you're a college athlete, if they don't think of, if you, they just think it's a cookie cutter program that you do, like they're not going to be as invested. But if you can be like, hey, this is how it's going to help your game. This is how it's going to help your body comp. This is how it's going to make you feel. Um, I think it just takes a few weeks of doing that and realizing, oh, I feel better. Mm -hmm. I look better and I can perform better. And then it helps to have other women now that like Instagram is in, inundated with, you know, great coaches like yourself that they can see and like, oh, she looks like me. She's this strong. Like, it's possible. So I think the biggest thing is, seeing what's possible and being like kelly squats 325 like and she looks similar to me like if i train hard i could do that too like it's within yeah. the realm which is awesome love that so thank you um and then one more question so we asked you a three-point question earlier this one's just a little different so if you go back in time to uh, kelly she just got out of college um and you're in this in-between space you're applying to jobs you don't if there are three things that you could tell young Kelly to either give her words of advice or encouragement, what are the, what would those three things be? Your parents were wrong. You're never going to <laughs> change your mind and decide you want a corporate job. So mm. keep going, which I did. So, um, I don't know. It's so hard. Cause like I'm, I'm sort of a firm believer that you just like end up where you're supposed to be. 100%, like there's yeah. not really anything that I look back on that I'm like, man, I wish I did that really differently. And I've always been like to that point, like my parent, when I said I was going to go and be a personal trainer, my parents were like, don't do that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> right. Sit. Makes you want to do it more. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and like, I always just like do what I want to do when I want to do it. Sometimes it works out great. Sometimes it doesn't. And I learn a lesson from that. And yeah. like, I don't really look back at my younger self thinking like I would have really benefited from doing this so differently because like I'm really happy where I am. I'm happy where I ended up. And I know I wouldn't be here if things didn't go exactly the way they went. So I know that wasn't an answer to your question, but <laughs> well, but you did a little bit because what I'm hearing is like, you know, maybe maybe the thing you you you're saying in that is like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like it's going to be OK. Yeah, it's going to be gonna okay. Be all right. And like you're I definitely I think imposter syndrome is something that's really has plagued me at different points in my career. Like sure. I think I always really felt like I wasn't smart enough or I wasn't qualified enough or I wasn't. Has I, that driven you, though? 
to yeah, be better? I think so. Um, for sure. I think that yeah. a little imposter syndrome is healthy. You know, yeah, I agree. You need yeah, it. yeah, yeah, you need like, it. Because if otherwise you're the dangerous 25 year old. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the what is it? The Dunning Kruger effect. It's yeah. like the, yeah. the less you know, the more you think you know. Yeah. And so a little imposter syndrome, I think, helped. But I also think like knowing that you deserve to be in the room and knowing that you deserve to be like doing what you're doing is also important. So in case anyone uh, hasn't found you already, Kelly, where are some places people can find you and consume your content and learn more about you? Well, I actually just started a YouTube channel. That's a new pew, thing. Pew, pew, pew. And so that is strong shit. And now I don't know my handle on on YouTube. I think it's strong with Kelly is the name of the channel. My handle is Kelly L. Matthews. Kelly L. Matthews is my handle on everything. So Instagram, TikTok, anywhere you want to find me at Kelly L. Matthews. And one more time, what's the name of the app and team that you train? It is the ladder app and my team is team limitless. Okay. Kelly, I love you. I love you. Thanks I love for you having too, me. Kelly. <laughs> yeah, we love you. <laughs> Thanks guys. Thank you for coming this on the fun. show. It has been fun. Until next time.